piece. And so these are one of the first digital color pages ever to be done on a comic out of Painter. So this was Fractal Design Painter, 1992. Took these around. And back then, when you go around to, especially at, at San Diego Comic Con, is anyone who's looking at your portfolio is a little man on the phone pole. The, the chances are they're looking at your portfolio because nobody else wanted to. Okay? Yeah. And so they usually give you criticism that's rote. You know, it's like, oh, something they heard from me, like they don't understand panel progression, they don't understand really storytelling. Either. They just heard that, oh, yeah, you don't want to go tangent like that, or you don't want to, you know, do this kind of thing. And this got the reaction, like, oh, it looks like, you know, it looks like it's big airbrush spray painted kind of thing, which kind of it does, was, you know, but it was yeah. like, you know, it was, and these were all digital inks too. This reminds me of uh, no some else of Neil Adams' uh, continuity stuff, the yeah. coloring in those, but, uh, so nothing in 92, a buddy of mine called me up in 93, <coughs> and he said, hey, I have, you know, that, and it was all the years before he was going around with the portfolio. I have a question though, before you jump to 93, so you, you're, you're working in TV, you're working yeah. at Warner Brothers. Yeah. I mean, but you still had this itch to get into comics, it sounds like. Okay, what, what was that? Why? Um, I like making things up, and I like drawing, and I like doing writing, so I like words and pictures, and okay. where else can you do words and pictures, and only do words and pictures that you can almost entirely control, and no one's going to tell you what to do. You know, anywhere along the process. Even if you are working for a major, chances are the editor's just busy to really tell you how to do anything. And you have a lot of freedom even with, with the, those situations. Because they're desperate. They, yeah. they want to book that one. They, you know, it's like, as long as you're getting that book, it's like, yes, don't kill Spider-Man. Like, yes, Spider <laughs> it's all good, you know. So, um, 93, a buddy of mine, Rod Underhill, had a table in the small press area. And, and he said, you want to split the table in the small press area? And I go, yeah, sure, why not? And I, got, I made this big, like, uh, 30 by 40, Green Lantern, all digitally colored by me. I actually put a 3D modeled power battery behind them, the 3D modeled wings that I had on the on the table. This, of course, that's back when monitors were deeper than they were wide. So it was like this big monitor. I had a 3D animated model spawn that I had on it coming down from the city land. It would just keep coming out and everything wow. like that. And everybody and their mother came by and offered me one. As opposed to the year before, nobody. This year, everybody. Okay, uh, and I went with uh, Mark Silvestri at Top Cow. When Top Cow would basically Mark, myself, David Wall, and that was it. Yeah, yeah. It was start the Top Cow to start the coloring department. And so you got to understand when I was first doing illustration stuff, when you wanted to do nice computer digital stuff, like we had to do really bandy color stuff back in the early days when you didn't have that many colors to work with on the computers. Mm -hmm. These originally cool computers were 256 colors, the Amigas that I was working on, I went for them because they did thousands of colors, but not millions of colors yet, you know? So the whole idea, as especially a digital person, it's like you want to start getting as smooth and realistic as possible. Go to work at Top Cow, and the style then was from uh, it was called the Cod Barrett system. It was a proprietary vector-based coloring system. It's what Steve Olaf, Oli Optics, who was the king of coloring back then. Yeah, he did a gear of the colorization. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so everything's vector. So if you know what that means, it's like you're drawing the shapes. Here, I can't even write. So, switch over to something else. Anyway, uh, anyway um, so it's all these bandy stuff, and I'm like, now, what do you mean by band? You want me to do that kind of style? You know, so everything, every band. So, so a color was would be based on so the face, the wider part of your face, that would be one color and be like the full shape. Mm -hmm. Then it'd be another band of color. There'd be no, no, no really fades hardly between the two. Okay. So it would be block of color, block of color, block of color. Maybe some radial fades or radial grads or things like okay. that. But really basic kind of stuff. But it was the style at the time. Like, okay, and then I also was like, okay, we had Joe Chido uh, was doing all the guides back then. This is a guide for a comic book. So that's hand color. Pass that around. <clears throat> so they hand me that, and I'm like, uh, can't we just scan that? <laughs> Isn't that good enough? You know, it's like this is another. This is actually a Steve Olaf guide. On the max, a little worse for wear on that Yeah, silverfish maybe. <laughs> it's cool though. It's, it's got a nice cool. effect to it. Here's another Joe Chido one. 
But you can see when you see that stuff, it's like, yeah, why don't I just stand up sitting in the day, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and the other interesting thing back then in 93 is to have a computer that could even color a color, that had enough power, you had to spend $10,000. Right. So the price of entry, there weren't a lot of, lot of individuals coloring comic books at that point. Because you know, it was just the price of getting into it was way too expensive. A hey, 11 by 17 flatbed scanner would run you $5,000. You know, um, a nice uh, photo reel laser printer would run you a good five to ten thousand dollars if it was a die sub printer or something. So the cost of getting involved was really great. But I have to give Joe a huge amount of credit because I learned almost all my coloring from that man. And that man, and that's, that's actually a Steve Olaf guy. Those two are Joe Chido guys. Joe could paint like a you know what. Okay. And he was all, he didn't do any digital, but it was all. No, no, it was all, he had his. Analog. He, he, had, his off, he had his office. Mm -hmm. there were, uh, he had, it was, we nicknamed him the harem because he had eight women working for him. And he was the guy who was the most scared about brown women in, in, in real life that you ever see. He was like, are you torturing yourself? Or are you trying to get acclimated? Or I don't understand. Anyway. So they would do the base color stuff, and then Joe would would go over it with color pencil, more color, tweaking it. So it was this whole big farm like this. At the time, Joe was coloring, doing guides for all of Jim's Wildstorm books, which were probably about six different books back then. Um, Cyber, we had a top tail we were doing at the time, just Cyber Force and code name Strike Force. So that was two. But then he also did uh, the Pit. He did. Uh, Wetworks, he did about six others. So they did about 20 books coming through just his little group of time doing color dots. That would then go where, wherever else those things would go. Um, I tell you, if I didn't start work in comics at, it was Amish, so it was Amish. It was Top Cow and Wildstorm were all in the same place. Wilson Pacio was there too. Um, and it was an open business style floor plan cubicles, no offices that closed, maybe one office that closed in the entire place, right? So you could walk around and if you weren't a jerk, sit behind anybody and watch them doing their stuff. So I just hit down behind Scott Williams as he's inking and learn from Scott Williams. The new kids that were there were Travis Cheris just started, Jeff Camel just started. This is probably an interesting thing. This is actually layouts from an old Gen 13. This is how Jeff would always do his books. So we do that four, those are four up. No, it's a Xerox. Okay. They're four up, and then Jeff would blow them up in light boxes. He was very <laughs> anal about this. <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't pass that around. But so you get to walk around and see, you know, Jeff Campbell working. Uh, you know, the new kids on our block that weren't good enough to work on books yet were uh, Joe Benitez and Billy Tan. And Joe Benitez is on that shirt right there. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and uh, and. Uh, well, Michael Turner too, right? At, at first. Not yet. No, okay. Michael wasn't there yet. Dave Finch mm -hmm. and Brandon Peterson, and uh, it was just, I mean, and you could go around just every, and everybody was out to beat everybody else. And image that was also started. really exciting. Everybody was pushing competitive. Yeah. Oh yeah. Image you know. started in '92, right? So this is yeah. like a year in after yeah. Image launched, and people are starting to learn about deadlines yes. and stuff. Yeah. And but that was also very valuable because at that time, Mark was like, "I want you to get it right." And not necessarily be fast yet. Mm -hmm. So it took me days to color my first comic book page. Regular comic book colors in the industry today color at least three pages a day. Okay. But when I started, it was one page, three days. But there was almost no one who ever taught that was good at doing this stuff. And I've taught a dozen, tons of these people doing this stuff. Um, nobody starts out fast. You just don't. Because the challenge of a comic book page, especially if you're a, an illustrator, is when you look at a comic book page, it has multiple panels. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're an illustrator, you look at each one of these things, going, "Oh my God, this is like a bunch of illustrations I'm doing at once. It's not just a page; it's a bunch of illustrations I'm doing at once. It's like, how do I get that done in a fast period of time? You know, so that's one of the challenges to get around too when you're doing this stuff. If you didn't have it slow, can I yeah, see yeah. this castle page? Did you draw that? This is J. M. Plato. This okay. is from Aria. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that had to have taken forever. Yes. Right? Can we hand it around? Is it yeah, yeah, please do. It's nice. Um, it's good to have a nice little group there. So yeah.
Um, so, anyway, so <clears throat> Top Cow, um, we were, I brought in a, a couple of cool colorists. <laughs> you were the VP of Creative Affairs. So I eventually, we, we eventually, image started eating itself, essentially, where everyone was getting really like ripping off everybody else's talent and all this kind of stuff. So Top we, Cow actually went to the side of all we, that. we went up to Santa Monica. We were originally going to go down and be in La Jolla where Jim was building this fancy new studio. But it's funny too because the bubble was already starting to burst. Mm -hmm. So I still remember I was standing in the same room back then with Jim Lee, Scott Williams, and, and Mark. And Jim was saying, saying, do you think we should cancel a book if it sells less than 500,000 copies? <laughs> that was a real, actual line. <laughs> okay. um, that doesn't happen. No. Uh, anyway, so um, we split up, went to, went to Santa Monica. Uh, I eventually ran the creative side of the company, um, and we launched Witchblade. We have a new kid, Mike Turner. I actually have some Xeroxes of the first, the first pencil book that Mike and I did together was a ballistic miniseries with Wetworks. Was that his first published work, or he did a one-shot? He did a, bits, a couple of bits and bobs. This was his first full book. Did you write it, or I wrote it? You wrote it. Okay. So that was ballistic. Now, did who who was the first to conceive of Witchblade? Sort of between you guys, was it something that just kind of snowballed between you and David? Wall it was me and David, and we. Uh, Basically, here's some other fun Xeroxes for you guys to pass around on time. These are great Capullo pencils from Spawn. Um, so we just decided that, you know, it, it was the bad girls were the big thing at the time, and she was the big book, and uh, Lady Death was a big book, yep. and we, out of our hubris, said, I think we could do better. <laughs> that's that's where it came from. Okay. We, we just decided we're going to do our. We're going to give her a job. You know, right. we're a little more her, characterization. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like and, and all that kind of stuff. And and uh, Mike was teed up for it. It was Dave Wall and I sitting. You know, at the pier in Santa Monica, hashing it out for the first time. Originally, she was going to be a fireman. Changed her into a police detective. Originally, her name was going to be Sarah Lopez, as opposed to Sarah Pizzini. Um, and we were gonna do a whole thing with Pezzes, but that never really kind of happened. <laughs> with Pezzes, yeah, yeah, like it would be like her candies. little, yeah, that would be like her little kind of side thing. Okay, you know, never really happened. Um, the deleted scene there. Yeah, <laughs> but that went really well. Why did you um, change it from Lopez to Pizzini? Mark's decision. Okay. Okay. He's like, no, no Lopez is Pizzini. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it's funny too, because I swear, if that happened, she was Lopez at the time, because Jennifer Lopez's crew was going at the one time. Where she probably would have been. There probably would have been a movie with her. Two and two. But that may not have been a good idea. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. Um, so anyway, um, so working there, at Top Cow, <laughs> Creative Affairs, we did this the swap of all the different image titles. So every image creator swapped their title that a month with the other creators. And will you please escort this guy? <laughs> I, I need him next weekend, so. <laughs> so we, we had... Um, uh, Was that like when uh, McFarland did Cyber Force number 10? Yes. And, and we did Spawn 25. Okay. And so... Uh, so that came out, and everybody really liked it. It also was what, what teed up Mark for doing The Darkness, because Mark was always, <coughs> always late on Cyberforce. Always late. Because <coughs> it's a team book, and you're drawing multiple figures every freaking page. Duh! And he did the Spawn issue, and he was the first time. He was done a week early. And he, he, he and his, 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 his girlfriend at the time were going to Paris. Okay, they're going to Paris. It's like, it's like, I think I need to do a single character book. And that's where the dark, Darkness was actually still around even when I was, where I started in 92. Okay. Mark just didn't know quite what to do with it yet. So it was an and idea he had, he just... Yeah, and yeah. Then, but then all of a sudden it's like, I, wait, I can do a single character book a lot easier than a character book. With, of course, then he goes, stupid Mark with like, oh, now we'll put a whole bunch of monsters around the darkness. Too. So it's kind of defeating the purpose at the same time of the single character book. But, you know, that's okay. Garth Ennis wrote those. He's the that first one. Yes, he did. Yeah. Um, but then... Uh, each one of the uh, image creators kind of had their right hand man at the time, you know. It's like, and uh, Tom McFarland was Terry Fitzgerald, and Terry and I had stro stroken up, you know, started a friendship and stuff. And we had uh, receptionists at Top Cow at the time. They're going, "Oh, 
Terry Fitzgerald's on the phone for you, Brian. Oh, great, okay, great. Yeah. Hey, Terry, how's it going? This isn't Terry. This is Todd. Hey, bud. So, you happy over there? <laughs> <laughs> After seeing Spawn 25. Yeah, how old were you? Yeah. And so, at the time, I was happy there. Mm -hmm. But then we were about to have uh, my first son. And things at Top Cow were kind of souring. The guy who was heading the business side of the company and I were butting heads left, right, and center. It's like I would leave and then he would undo half the things I did that day. And it became like, okay, you know, I think I'm going to take it to Todd's. Like, you can live wherever you want, you can do whatever the hell you want, you know, as long as I'm your first priority, it's all good. And so I started uh, Haberlin Studios and we started my coloring studio. And the coloring studio, and at the same time, then it was like, you know, Jimmy and Joe were going to about to start Marvel Nights, and they came out and flew me out there and wine and dined me, and they like, can you do every single book we're going to do? No. I can do some of them. No, can you do every single book we're going to do? <laughs> no, I can do some. Um, and so this coloring, the coloring studio was started. Mm -hmm. And we did work for, for everybody. Um, uh, even did uh, the, uh, the weirdness of uh, Heroes Were Born on the uh, Captain America that Rob did the first yeah. one. Because this was the meeting with Rob, okay? So <clears throat> when, I, when I finally was like, now, not under contract with anybody, I was open to work with anybody I wanted to do, and I was the guy at the moment. Um, I was going to meet with Rob. He was like, guy contradicts himself 25 times in the same meeting. The most amazing kind of flipping back and forth that you think he's not even conscious of it, right? Trump. But then you, <laughs> then you have the, the moment he goes, I want to be known as the guy who pays the most in the industry. I'm thinking in my head, I'd like to be the guy who gets paid the most in the industry. <laughs> but it was such a nightmare to work with it. We did the one issue and that was... Which one did you do? The first. No, that Captain America one. Did you do the one where Chuck? Yeah, there. That's, yeah. Not, uh, <laughs> that's not my fault. Oh, you posted it. <laughs> that's, that's not my fault. Well, that was. I mean, Rob was of that whole thing. He was the only one that got fired right before the thing ended, and yeah, then he went so. and took his pages and started another comic. What's a Cooper Petzl? That's oh, nice. Um And then it became more like okay. The coloring thing is fine, it's really paying the bills, it's enabling me to be home with my child and all that stuff, being born, but I gotta get into the creating stuff again. You know, this is kind of So I launched Avalon Studios with Will Spartacio, and we did Aria, which is, these are some of the pages from Aria. Be careful with these guys. Those are original. Well, these are we original. don't have to hand those out. No, it's okay. Be <laughs> careful with them. Get your ketchup back We did Aria. Stone. Stone. Now that wasn't under image though. This is all. The, this is the, the, the very got. first. The very first stone was the highest selling independent book of the year it came out, which was ninety eight. Mm -hmm. um, and then we folded in the second issue with image. So okay. we were image from from that point out. Okay. So Aria was with image, even though it was under our Avalon Comics banner. So we had Aria. We had the horror book, The Wicked, <coughs> and we had Hellcat. Is still one of my favorite books. Did who wrote Hellcat? Was that Scott Lobdell? No, it was me. Oh, was you? Oh, okay. Actually, no, I'm sorry. It wasn't. We, I was busy okay. doing Stone. It was just, Joe just Casey. Joe Casey. Yeah, right. Cool. Joe Casey wrote it. And so, too, again, I'm throwing out this stuff as I see it here, guys. This is interesting. This is, we did Area 52. Um, which has been optioned a gazillion times. I've made way more off option money on this area for to do than I ever made on the <laughs> Um But this, this, this is this will probably be interesting, you guys. So these are the samples of a young artist that I hired to do Area Fifty Two. This is his first. This was his before being pro samples. This is Clayton Henry's um, samples. He does all the uh, like sort of digital. He does a lot of that. Stuff, he does right? the, no. He does Valiant. Oops. Okay. I don't know what I think about. Think about Clayton Crane. Yeah. Thinking about yeah. That's Henry. Yeah. So along your path, you've encountered a lot of people that were just, you know, a lot of like guys like a lot of guys I gave their first chance. So, yeah. so, so him. This is one of the first pieces ever done by David Yarden. He did Aria for a little bit as well. Okay. How do you find all these guys? They just come to you, or? Uh, yeah, it was more like when I was looking for them, you know, it, it, uh, you know I was looking for them, so. Yeah. yeah there were some other things. This is some interesting pencils. This is from uh, one of our other books, Joe Kelly and Duncan Rulu and Emma Emrex. Which was turned into an animated it series? It became yeah. Mac, 
Generation Rex. Generation Rex. I read your Wikipedia page. It's all fresh. And what was nice is I actually got a royalty check about that. So is that sort of like uh, they, they kind of wound up becoming man of action, right? Yes. And with the Ben 10 and all that. Yeah. 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 This is another cool, uh, that's from uh, Ballistic. That's my turn. Do you think your experience in you know working at Warner Brothers has informed and given you a different perspective in how you approach making comics? Yeah, I think so. I, I think I, I definitely, I, I, I really do like television a lot. In fact, we are we now have our showrunners for Faster Than Light yeah. and our fan financing. So I think we have a really excellent chance of being a regular series very shortly. But but no, I, I think to go back to it. This is some more of those uh, four-up layouts that Jeff Campbell would do. Yeah. <laughs> and one of the first Joe Casada pencils from Daredevil Marvel Knights. So anyway, so I started doing my own books. Uh, what eventually happened with Avalon Studios? Avalon Studios eventually my business partner wasn't carrying his weight. Let's put it that way. Okay. <laughs> yeah, right. And uh, it became very easy. I mean, doing comics, especially then, because I wasn't really, you know, I was coloring books, doing some covers on books, writing some books, but I didn't have the chops then to pencil and ink a monthly book myself. Okay. So when people do start, you know, letting you down and that kind of thing, it gets, yeah. yeah, you're not just carrying your weight, you're carrying his weight. Yeah, so I wasn't really to jump ready at that point to jump into that thing, so it became all those, all the companies wanted to pay me through the nose to color for them and have the studio color for them, and it was much easier to do that and not drive myself crazy than to do that. And then eventually I went in and became editor-in-chief for Todd McFarland. How'd that happen? Um, Larry Martyr was the president yeah, of Todd McFarlane Productions at the time. Yeah. Um, and they were looking for, I mean, it was just kind of going on fumes. You know, yeah. it really was just. Larry Martyr did a, a strange little comic called Tales from Bean World about beans. Anybody who can't draw, I would say do a comic about beans. And, did. <laughs> and, and, it, and it, no, it still comes out. It's the new collections from Dark Horse. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, wasn't he like the head of Image? He was the, he was the mm -hmm. image, image publisher of Lola. Yeah, who like what Eric Stevenson is now. Yeah. That was Larry. That was Larry. And, and uh, so, yeah. So we had um, with Todd, um, and Todd and I, you know, I've been, at this point before I took over as Energy, I've been coloring Spawn for. 150 issues, I guess, or something like that. So I know this guy pretty well for a while, and he trusted me. I was like, okay, well, let's 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 do some stuff. You know, that, that's obvious. You know, there's a low hanging fruit here. It's like there was never a collection of the Brian Bendis Sam and Twitch stuff before. Okay, easy, we'll do that. You know, it's like there was never a collection of the Ashley Wood stuff. Yeah. Okay, duh, let's do that. So you're just you're kind of looking at this library and saying, hey, let's put this out. Yeah, and there was there was actually a published manga in Japan that was done that Todd had the rights to republish here. It's like, okay, <laughs> let's do that too. Oh, right, right. And then it's like, but now let's expand the line a little bit. Let's say, at the time his, his, his dragon toys were doing really, really well, right? And I was like, okay, I think I see an opportunity for myself to, I want, I want to do a book, okay. right? And so these were the first pages from the Todd McFarlane, what would have been the dragon book. What was it called? Marlon's Dragons, I think, is what it was going to be. Uh, and at the time, Angel was becoming a little difficult on Spawn. Spawn was becoming a little difficult. I was doing these pages, saying over to Todd. Todd would look at him and stuff. And then the phone conversation went like, Hey, but you know, the guy who's doing this Dragon book, he's pretty good. I think maybe he should take over Spawn. Like, Todd, that's me, right? <laughs> <laughs> so the Dragon Book got entirely shelved. We only did about 10 pages of it, did about four covers. Uh, and then I took over Spock. And that was with, I brought over a new writer, David, David Hine. He was just a brilliant writer. Um, had he written comics before then? Or? Yeah, okay. he had. Um, 
Let me see if I have any of the spawn pages in there. Well, I have some new spawn pages that <coughs> will probably be coming out. So, that, so you guys don't know about this, but this would be some Oh, this is being filmed, don't forget. It's, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for spawn. Yeah. Something new for next year. So, so you still you, you still can, work with Todd? Yeah, I mean we're time. we're still friends and stuff like that, and call up and everything like that. Let's see if I have anything. Like that. But but I was lucky enough. Let's see if I have this queued up for you. That when I was working with Todd, I also got to work and become very very good friends with, of course, Greg Pulo over the years. Mm -hmm. And between the two of those guys. They are the best teacher of comics art in the entire world. And I've worked with some pretty good guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I think they're great, but what, what makes them... They can, they so can tell you... Jim can tell you how to draw like Jim. Okay. Jim can tell you how he draws, why he draws like Jim. <laughs> Todd can tell you how to draw in a number of styles mm -hmm. and how panels work in all different ways. And he's like, this is how I do it. But this isn't the only way to do it, all right? You find, he gives you, which is the way I teach currently, is I'm about giving you guys as many weapons as possible, okay? And then you're gonna find out, are you a two-handed broadsword guy? Or are you a rapier guy? Or are you bow and arrow? I mean, you're gonna find the tool that you like, you know? So that was the value of working with Greg and Todd, is it was about telling stories. It was about however you got there, and they could show you how to get there from any different angle, which was incredibly. I mean, like Mark, I mean, Silvestri, Mark can show you how to be Mark. Mark can't show you how to be another good poet. So these guys, they can give you tools that can be applied to whatever your your skill set yeah. is, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. I think this thing is alive. So you went. You eventually left being editor-in-chief there. Uh, I did. <laughs> what was that transition? Well, These guys had a lot of transitions. <laughs> so, um, I was, at the time, we were trying to staff uh, Robert Kirkman's and Todd's comic book. Mm -hmm. And there was basically no one around. Thank you. Uh, there was it was at the time when Marvel and DC were both locking every single person up who was any of any value. That was working. No, I think it's this one, Mike. This thing would be a little tricky. <coughs> um, and so it was really difficult to find anybody. And we'd be in the meetings and stuff with people. And, and Todd would be going, yeah, bud, you know, during the main, you, you don't be me sitting with, with an artist in the book. So, you, you don't want to be known for doing Stan and Jack's characters. You want to be known for doing uh, doing, uh, doing your own characters, you know? And then and Robert would chime in going, same thing. And I'd be sitting in the back going, I used to do my own characters, you know? <laughs> and it became a certain point where, you know, I've got to, I've got to, I've got to move on. Mm -hmm. It's been great. Love you. Love all the stuff. But I gotta start my own thing. So, I was going to take, Marvel had offered me a, a very cherry deal to do some books there. Mm -hmm. And a guy from Hollywood, Skip Rittenham, called me up. And now when I was in TV, his firm, Ziff and Rittenham, basically ran television. They were the biggest, and he still is the biggest entertainment attorney in the world, so I figured, yeah, yeah, it's worth taking a meeting with this guy, right? You know, I, I mean, the plan was to do Marvel work as my day job, and then do my own creator own work with the rest of my time. Okay. Met with Skip, and Skip had the story outline for a book called Clone World. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, you know, start going through it. And it's like, well, you know, I'm busy, but you know, maybe some because at that time also I was still there have been times when I've read artists too. You know, and, and as well. Just Maybe I find some of my guys to do it, that kind of thing, or package it. There were a lot of packaging stuff going on. When you're an independent creator and you're doing <coughs> your own comics, often how most small comic companies make their extra money is by packaging books for people who come into their life. For example, like Stan Winston, we did his books. We did Realm of the Claw, and we did, uh, we did, uh, uh, God, what's that guy's name? I forget his name. Track. Um, and those are very, very lucrative. 
recruited books to you. It's like usually you can get paid between twenty to forty thousand dollars for packaging a comic book. Okay. And so when you say a, packaging, you mean that means you make, putting the artist on yeah, it, overseeing yeah. the 